Welcome back to Brass and Bourbon. We've got my next guest, Ashley Reynolds, uh, mother of four, wife, uh, bikini pro, new student of mine. I've uh, been shooting for about four months now. Um, it's pretty much any, there's nothing that she doesn't do. Uh, she's an entrepreneur, a couple of business owners. So what have I left out? I don't, I, we'll unpack it all. We'll, un, we'll unpack it all. <laughs> new inspirations lead to new titles, I guess. <laughs> outdoor channel, uh, former outdoor channel host. <laughs> yeah, he's a, bit of a professional hunter. Uh, yeah, a yeah. little bit of everything. So You just got to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, so welcome. Uh, so something we do... Um, at the beginning of every episode is we introduce a drink uh, and you've already been drinking a little bit of wine. I'm not going to make you mix uh, a whiskey and a wine. Uh, so Appreciate I will be that. Thank you. <laughs> enjoying. How about uh, I just smell it? You can smell I'm a big smell fine. person. So this isn't actually a bourbon. Uh, this is a rye. This is Whistle Pig, Whistle Pig 15. This is uh, actually a, a gift from some family. Uh, so this is a really, really nice uh, rye. Um, but I'll let you check that out and let you smell it. So it's a really, it's one of my favorite rye's. Uh, you know, rye is also a bread. I, I'm where rye is also a bread. <laughs> yeah. So. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's whistle pig. But. We should have some. That's really good. Rob, 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 I'm having whistle pig right now. Are you, are you talking about rye bread? Did you know rye bread's used on one of my favorite sandwiches? Does that include peanut butter? We, we made burgers the other night. We all got together collectively as a, as a group, and he was the only one that put peanut butter on his burger. <laughs> so there was burger, cheese, peanut butter, and then lettuce, the tomato, lettuce, tomato, uh, onions. Did you put mayonnaise on it? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's the, it's, anyway, sweet, spice, and everything nice. There oh, we go. There you go. You're drinking wine right now, and this is something uh, I got my wife uh, told me to pick up it's a cab um i know a little bit about wine not a lot uh cab uh freak show so that's this is actually enjoying. a really great wine for the price point freak show is so yeah if you want a good cab with a great price point i would definitely recommend yeah i'm not a big wine guy but i like cabs and that's that's a really good one but i'm enjoying the the whistle pig she's enjoying the cab so yeah so well, I guess we're brass bourbon and wine tonight. So we are. That should be a new thing when you have a wino. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, let's let's uh, unpack a little bit and uh, tell us a little bit. Maybe start with uh, I guess a little bit about your past, uh, wherever you want to start. Whether it's the outdoor channel to I like to start it to how you got to your self-defense slash training adventure with me oh wow so uh, actually i would say the self-defense interests started early earlier on in life probably more than anything um not for necessarily self-defense but i had a deep profound interest in archery um i grew up in miami florida and i grew up around the everglades and around deer gators hogs turkey everything the 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 great part of Florida that tourists don't get to see is what I grew up around. And um, whenever we would go to Bass Pro Shops, I would always find myself just walking the archery section and um, just took a great interest in it. And so when I um, navigated my life up until I met you, self-defense and shooting was a great interest of mine just from the start. Um, right. And then I met you, and you really accelerated accelerated that. You really brought a, a dream to life, per se. Mm -hmm. um, but, so I grew up in Florida, um, hunting horses, archery, and um, ended up moving to South Carolina and learned how to shoot, started shooting archery competitions, did some college, we're running back to Florida, studied marine biology because I love the ocean, um, ended up... I know I'm bouncing. I was, thinking, up, I was thinking about uh, your uh, orca. No, your shark tracking. I love to track sharks. They're amazing. <laughs> no, just <laughs> that just that popped in my head. So I studied. So I studied marine biology because <laughs> I love the ocean, and I track sharks as a 35 year old woman. 
<laughs> what's, your my, fa- what's your favorite shark? On my phone. His name is Ironbound. <laughs> <laughs> where's, where's he at right now? I don't know. Do you want me to tell you? Yeah. Where's Ironbound at right now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what's this app? We'll give this app a shout out. Um, the app is actually called uh, Shark Tracker by Ocean Tech. <laughs> <laughs> And um, you just have your animals. <laughs> you have multiple. Yes, but I have favorites, so I heart my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so Ironbound has not pinged recently because he's in the, the great deep blue. And so, <laughs> but let me see. Let me see if I can. Ironbound, well, he's a favorite. He has traveled 15,186 miles. He's a fierce apex predator for sure uh, underneath the orca. This is him. He's a, he's a great white, right? He is. <laughs> very, very, very masculine great white. <laughs> and he is 12 feet, 4 inches long. And he was last pinged on March 6th. So, you know, he stays, he stays elusive for sure. And... Um, let me see where he is at. He is in Nova Scotia right now. Is that how you pronounce it? Nova Scotia. Perfect. Nova Scotia. Sco- Nova Scotia. <laughs> I can't pronounce it because I've never been. Nova Scotia. Yeah, I said Scotia, by the way. <laughs> um, just want to throw that out there. Okay, so school, me, went back. So you did that marine biology in Florida? Mm hmm. Okay. Did marine biology um, in Florida, and then I went to South Carolina. I learned how to shoot archery, and then I was walking something called the ATA, which is an Archery Trade Association. It's a private event where consumers meet athletes, is what we'll call them, and they basically discuss scholarships and sponsorships and what the next year is going to look like as far as if they're going to get, you know, what what the next year is going to bring for these companies and corporations, and they do a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. And I was offered a spot hosting a show called Night and Hales Ultimate Hunting, which is one of the longest running outdoor television mm-hmm. shows in history. And I was blessed enough to be able to take it. And I got plugged in with um, Harold and David Knight, which own Night and Hale game calls mm-hmm. that they did before they sold it um, to Pride Co Outdoor Brands. But, and that opened a whole new world for me. I traveled a lot and I got to meet a lot of great people and really just take my life to the next level um through that i met my now husband and we just kept doing business from there you know so what kind of hunts did you do while you were there i didn't get to mark off my entire bucket list but i got to do hog hunts turkey gator whitetail what was your favorite oh turkey Turkey, yeah. 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 It's just turkey hunting is it's underrated. You know, it's just you get to call them in. You get to do a lot of like running, gunning with turkey hunts. And so that was pretty awesome. And turkeys, they're so smart and they have incredible eyesight. Mm-hmm. And so to be able to just bag a turkey is, it's a pretty uh, now, do you like, amazing experience. Do you like to turkey hunt with a shotgun or with a bow? My first turkey was with a bow. So if it was my preference, just for bragging rights, a bow. <laughs> yeah, but for convenience, a shotgun. shotgun. And yeah. and I've gotten to see some amazing interaction between turkeys and hens while hunting, and it's it's just yeah. amazing. They're just an awesome. Yeah, animal. they'll turkey a buster pretty quick. You got to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a braggable hunt for sure. For some reason, every time I go deer hunting, I see more turkeys deer hunting than I ever do when I turkey hunt. It's, mm-hmm. it's, and then vice versa. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because you're a big hunter. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I don't do a lot of turkey hunting, but like I said, up, you know, during, sometimes during deer season mm-hmm. in Kentucky, turkey season and deer season overlap during bow season. So a lot of times, you know, late, late turkey season, uh, sorry, late deer, deer season. And if it's still turkey season, I may, I got my archery out. I'll, uh, you know, if I'm not seeing anything, I may try to, you know. You Check should. a turkey if I if I see one within range with the bow, but you know it's one of those deals that's only been it's only happened a couple of times, uh, and it's one of those deals where it's you, they'll they'll bust you as quick if not easier than a deer. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. Especially yeah. if you're surrounded by a lot of young deer or yeah. young bucks that are just curious and they just walk right up to you. 
Oh yeah. And turkeys would never do that. Yeah, yeah, a turkey never. Do that. Yeah. yeah. So I've had I've had young bucks just like just basically sniff me. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. Hey, what are you doing here? Yes. Like, oh hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, leave me alone, man. Yeah. <laughs> Where, where's your dad at? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, but turkeys no. No. Like I said, it's a braggable it's a braggable hunt, especially with a bow. It's 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 just an amazing experience, turkey hunting all together. What's your what's your uh what was your most strenuous hunt? Oh, God. well, it's, okay. Mm. It's a couple really frustrating hunts, but there was one hunt that I was really passionate about. I was on a gator hunt, and my my cousin, he is a fire chief out in Florida, and he guides stingray hunts, gator hunts, turkey hunts, hawk hunts, and he mounts for Bass Pro Shops. He's amazing. I, anyway, he was taking me on a gator hunt, and we were hunting all night. You hunt all night in Florida for gator. In this 12 foot, I mean, probably even bigger than that, monster gator presented herself. I'm going to say her because there's no way she was that amazing and Ben, not her. And then, so anyway, <laughs> so I was standing on the edge of this bass boat and I had this crossbow and I knew where I had to shoot and she just presented herself so perfectly for a perfect shot. And I mean, it was, it was like I was just... I was closer to her than you are to me. And it was like I was just looking at a dinosaur. And I, I blew it. And the whole night I was so upset. And I ended up leaving with a gator and probably 11 feet. Mm. Um, but that moment, I'll, I'll never forget the moment I saw her and how she presented herself and then just how I just completely blew it. And how I felt in that moment thinking like this was the, the hunt of a lifetime and I just bombed it. It's almost... It's like the this past deer season for me. I, I took my crossbow out. Now, I've never shot crossbow mm -hmm. hunting. You know, I've practiced with it all, you know, prior to season. I had no issues, mm -hmm. and I shot under a, a doe. Which you know, everybody's like, "Oh, a doe? Who, who cares?" Well, I mean, I, what a lot of people don't know is like, I eat, I only eat venison. My, mm -hmm. my family only eats venison for red meat. So like, that's meat off the table. Mm -hmm. So. Basically, after that that one shot I missed, I mean, I, you know, it was my fault. But at the same time, I was like, I swore off that. So, I, I mean, I went straight back to going back straight archery, you know, because I'm more comfortable just drawing a bow back. Yeah. Because I, I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. What, do gators have, like, did you have to use a crossbow? Could you have used a, a gun, like a, a twenty two or something? At the you top? have to. Yeah. So, basically, the crossbow is what allows you to pull the gator in. Mm. So, that's so not it's, what so it's actually like, it's, So, it's like bow fishing almost. Yeah, but you still got to, like, you still have to use, like, a bang stick. So, you have to bring them in. You have to grab them by their tail while they're still fighting you. And you mm. have to then find the perfect spot to get through the yeah in the hunt yeah and so that that's pretty stressful but yeah. the fight's pretty amazing because you got to think like you have this 13 foot just like man eater at the end of your line and you're just fighting them you know it's just i can't explain it and gator meat's amazing oh yeah you know? and yeah. you gotta you gotta think if you fall in that water you know there's... you're in their world then yeah <laughs> yeah and so I love gator hunting, but I grew up in Florida around gators. So yeah. There's gators everywhere, and so you have a respect. And you know, here you don't have to worry about deer too much. No, <laughs> no, here you have to worry about other things, but not yeah. that. Yeah. No, not that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's a little bit different. A little bit. I mean, I think the worst thing you go out to Western Kentucky and a little bit of Eastern Kentucky, we have feral hogs. That'd be something we have to worry about here quite a bit. Yeah. Start getting out there. Look at that a little bit north, like northern Florida. Now, you were telling me about you had a hog hunt one time that was pretty scary that ran you up, a, ran a you up a tree, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was in South Carolina. I was doing a evening hog hunt in the middle of the night with some dogs, and we got on a hog that was. He was probably a a bar hog. So have you ever heard of that? Like a. Mm -hmm. So basically, what they do is they basically castrate these hogs, and once you castrate them, they just get bigger and bigger, and you can really trophy hunt a, mm. a barbore, and that could be the case here. But anyway, he was really aggressive, and he put me up a tree. 
Oh, wow. And there was dogs everywhere. And I would say looking back, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Like, what is it called? A Monday quarterback? Yeah. Uh, I probably shouldn't have been hunting with the people I was hunting with. Mm-hmm. And there was just gunshots going off everywhere, shooting blindly in the middle of the night. And you just hear dogs barking, people screaming, and I'm just up a tree. And I'm just a bloody mess all over me from going through the thicket. Mm. trying to locate this hog off of the dog's location we're following a gps Mm. and it's just a lot of loud noises trying to get through and then it being a really bad situation dogs like they they're lucky to be alive but yeah we ended up leaving out successful if that's what you want to call it (laughs) i still call it a big fat fail you know just Mm. given the circumstance but yeah it was terrifying their hogs are no joke yeah, not a hunt that you feel good about at least. Uh, no, it was traumatizing on, on every aspect, probably the hogs aspect, our aspect, the dogs aspect. It was just yeah. not a good feeling leaving. Yeah, it. I could see that being a really stressful event. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, especially gunshots going blindly in the night. And you're blindly. Just, you're just stuck up a tree. Yeah, that'd be... Blindly. That's a, that's a butthole factor. Type, yeah, you know. it was terrible. I, looking back again, like I never... Knowing what I know now and... Just being where I'm at in my life, I never would have gone with the people I went with. Okay. But I did. Yeah. I don't, it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, so going from the outdoor channel, so what what happened after that? Um, I met Caleb, who's my husband now, and we just, I was always more business minded, always wanted to start business, um, and we were heavy into fitness. I started working out probably when I was about 22 always dreamed of being a bikini athlete, a bikini pro. I just loved the body and how amazing it responds to food and um, ended up becoming a bikini pro later on um, and made a business out of it. Started doing online training, opened up my own fitness clothing line and it all did really, really, really well, Mm. exceptionally well. Um, But I always knew I didn't want to be a... I didn't want to be dependent on the internet because mm-hmm. you just never know mm-hmm. with the internet. And so we we always discussed starting something more within the community and that led us into opening up the company we own now, which is contracting. Right. right. So we have it, we have all of those going. Right, well I know my wife really likes the, your, uh, your clothing line, she really likes the, your leggings, so. Yeah, yeah. There, it's a great, it's a, it's a hidden jewel. Yeah. And, I, and I'm trying to get you to come out with some uh, tactical leggings for, for the ladies that want to conceal carry because women don't have a really good option for conceal carry. And I think you have the ability to help that option. So You'll have to help design those. But Well, I don't know crap about women's clothes. I'm not a... You, know, you just got to give the ideas, you know, because you do know about firearms and what it takes to conceal them and hold them and what would be best case scenario for a high pressure situation. So... You can give the feedback on to, hey, this could be the situation, and then I could go, oh, well, we need more elastic. And then elastic. we would go from there, yeah. Elastic! <laughs> <laughs> and then we would go from there. <laughs> Velcro. Yes, exactly. But that's what I'm saying is it might take four or five tries before we nail down the perfect type of legging if we really want it to be a quality product not right. just a product that we can throw out any product i can make a product in two weeks yeah the stuff there's stuff out there but i mean every time i see stuff out there huh. i'm like yeah everything just seems kind of rushed yeah do we want it to be good or great and that's just up to us right you know that is literally a dream product for me it's hard for me to conceal anything on my person i assume it is for you too right. if there was a type of legging with a certain kind of holster built in i know you're not big on like nylon holsters but something that can maybe have some kind of trigger guard that would be right. amazing well, yeah. there, there's one holster that I, i've been recommending quite a bit um and i'm well, we're not sponsored by anybody but i recommend it to ever i recommend it to you um which we still have to order yours tonight um it's what my wife carries it's a, a enigma holster by uh, i don't want to say the name Phil star or something it's but it's, it's called the enigma uh, it's its own chassis system and its own belt system, and mm-hmm. um, for uh, women uh, and for guys too, it, it can. Uh, you know, I ran one for a little bit because I don't. I don't recommend anything that I'm not willing to try myself. Um, but for appendix carry, 
Um, it does a really, really, really good job um, fitting uh, under any, any type of clothing. So gym shorts, yoga pants, jeans, and you're not really required to wear a, a belt with it. So, uh, cause it has, it's, it has its own chassis system, um, and own belt system built into it. Uh, and I, that's something that I would somehow like to incorporate would be a belt system, um, that your, that the holster could latch onto, um, uh, or any holster, you know, wouldn't be limited to just one type of holster. So if you have multiple firearms and you have uh, multiple holsters, you could latch on to that. So that that would be a, a big, for me, would be a big selling factor uh, to a concealed carry garment. Um, but anyways, I don't Well, know it's that. funny because you always tell me I go from like zero to 100. And in my brain, as you were talking to me, I was already at 100. But mm. if, like I said, it could take four or five or six or seven different tries because right. we have to design and get a prototype back and then test it out and then make changes to really perfect it. But I really think that if we could perfect something, we could easily, easily wholesale sell it oh, to yeah. um, different places that would offer that mm. and definitely be able to bring a product to the market that could really benefit women everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, guys have all, all kinds of fit, uh all kinds of options and and the women market has gotten better over the years it's just not anywhere near where the guy market is and i think it can get there it's just yeah. it needs a little bit more work um yeah and, and but you know at the same time women have what i've noticed the trends women have just recently in the last i'd say less than five years have really started taking concealed carry to the next level probably a little bit later than that maybe seven seven years or more. i would have to agree with that first timeline yeah but yeah. It's, it's really it seems like to me it's, it's really jumped up and, and i've noticed it which just you know since i've started my my company you know it, it's it, i have more women private students and i typically have more women students in general than i do guys and i don't know if it's because guys have a more of an ego thing or going on or or what but I typically have more interest it's weird so like more more guys show up to scheduled classes more women show up to private classes and and um, you know things like that so it, it but I, I see a lot more women reaching out having conversations than I do guys so it's it's and, it's, and women I think are more prone to asking like for help hey yeah. can you teach me hey can you help me or hey can yeah, you show me and not to knock you guys but i think women are much more resourceful in that aspect they're always reaching asking trying to yeah. learn grow and i think it's I, well, it for guys it's an ego thing it took me i mean for i think i didn't start i did not start getting good as a shooter until i learned to swallow my ego and realize that for me to get good i needed to realized that I was not good at my current level and I needed to listen to people that were better than me. Yeah, and you still do a lot of classes because I feel like I will message you and you'll be like, oh, I'm doing a class on this month or this month or this month. Like he's, You're always trying to, always learning. Always learning. Yeah, well, try. I mean, uh, the way I look at it is the, the, day that, uh, the day that I'm not teachable and the day that I'm not willing to uh, perfect my craft is the day I'm no longer relevant as a teacher well you're a phenomenal teacher and with going back to like women and how women think versus men think i could be wrong on this so i hate saying this on record so i i, <laughs> no, I, I mean, could that, this is gonna be public so <laughs> i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure with the way that a woman's brain works as opposed to men i think women from my understanding think more ahead they think of everything that probably could go wrong mm. and then they try to prepare for that as where men don't typically think that way i know from my personal outlook on it especially after having kids i think of everything that could go wrong and then i'm trying to prevent it ahead of time mm. and so with the news and the way the media has been um, we all know where that's going mm. i have thought you know what if i'm ever in a situation where I find myself in an active shooter, shooter, shooter situation, God forbid, I want to be able to eliminate the threat. And so that has been a really big concern of mine for a long time, especially with 
having children. And so that is what forced me into really, Mm. that's what like pushed me. I always had an interest in it sport wise, but what pushed me into the personal protection is that deep fear of, am I in this situation? How can I protect myself and everyone around me? Well, I can't speak forever. I'm not, I'm not going to speak for every guy because I know every guy does not think like me. And I think like a very small, small percentage of, of, of men, uh, in my career, career path and my, my training. Um, but you know, you know, I think I, the way I think, I think of, uh, uh, most probable course of action, what's most probably going to happen, and then, you know, the m- most worst course of action. So I train for the worst course of action, but I, you know, but I also think what's, what the more likely thing is going to happen. So I want to be prepared for what the worst thing could happen is, but I also understand that this is what the, the most likely outcome is going to be. So that's how my brain processes information. And you have you've obviously been exposed to like high pressure situations since your military and then now being a deputy. So you see a lot more than what like a civilian would see. Like you see the worst of the worst, you know what I mean? And so I think that that would also change the way your thought process was. Right. Yeah. So, you know, something I just noticed just in general with people, uh, a lot of people just, and, and this is not knocking people in general, but this is how most people, most people go throughout life, living their day to day life, not aware of the things around them. Uh, they go throughout life, uh, getting their Starbucks, looking down at their phone, uh, not being aware, and you know, living that American dream, um, and. They don't understand that the evils are around them, mm-hmm. uh, and then there's a lot of there's a lot of things, and and I'm not saying that everything's evil uh, around you, but there's a lot of a lot of things out there. Th- there's a lot of things out there that do go bump in the night that you're unaware of. Yeah. Um, that it's better to be prepared for, and never have to ever use that skill than when you need that skill and not know what to do because yeah. you're because when you're training if if you have zero training and you're presented with a situation you're not going to rise to the occasion you're going to resort to your lowest level of training uh, so whatever you've done the most is what you're going to do so if you have failed to train your your fight flight or freeze you're either going to run away you're going to do nothing and freeze and curl up into a ball and cry, mm-hmm. uh, or you you may fight. So if you trained a lot, you may you may do some fighting. If you done, you know, you may go into a, a primal instinct and may just do some type of flaring around and fighting. Um, but if you've done training, you've made your training uh, um, habitual, and you've uh, you know got a process going, whether that is martial arts training. Uh, uh, and you need to do a little bit of all of this martial arts training exercise uh, and uh, firearms uh, self-defense training uh, if you've done a little bit of all this and you've made it habitual and made it part of your 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 life um, you're building a surplus of skill and when you're presented with that threat your brain can process that information because you've built these files you've built neural pathways in your brain to say I can solve this problem, uh, and that problem may not require you to ever fire a shot, or may require you never to have to punch somebody, but you can problem solve that because you've you've been able to analyze that versus just having overstimulation where you freeze. Mm-hmm. So it's it's funny because I was a firearm owner <laughs> before I met you right. and then meeting you and working with you and learning from you has taught me that I really probably should not have owned any firearm before ever learning and, and you know and I shot archery for a long time there is a big difference mm-hmm. but um, where now I have learned so much from you I look back and I thought man even though I had a firearm I was still so unprotected because I really didn't know how to use it or how to keep my brain focused or what to do. And now, even though I have so much further to go, I at least know like 
hey, this is how I'm gonna hold my firearm, this is where I'm gonna shoot, this is how fast I can shoot, this is what I'm gonna do to get on target. Like it's just a different level of confidence. Right. And now we have gone from training for competitions because that's where we started mm -hmm. to kind of gearing a little more towards self-defense with concealed carry. Right. I, I see now that we're starting to merge more of the two in our lessons. Right. Um, I see where they're so different, but alike in many ways, you know, when it comes to having to actually get on target. Right. And, and especially being in stressful situations, like if you if you're good at one you can be good at the other yeah and if you're if you're great at one you can be better at the other yeah um you know it's one of those things you know you know i'm, I'm fairly new to the civilian competition world um and, and i'm wanting to you know i'm very i'm very competitive um so but one thing that I, I don't want to do is i don't want to sacrifice a whole lot of uh we'll say i don't want to say tactics but i don't want to sacrifice a whole lot of uh you know, uh, I don't want to build a lot of bad habits mm -hmm. just to be competitive, but I also want to learn more about skill building. Mm -hmm. So when I'm shooting competition, I'm taking that more of a, as a time as skill building, you know, shooting faster, moving, because there's a lot of movement. You saw a couple of, some of the competitions, so it's a lot about movement shooting fast uh processing information you know you know i had a I had a, a, a guy tell me that you know you have to separate the two and when the way he described the the differences to me it really made a lot of sense to me you know you know when i'm at work i can't see through a wall that i'm i'm working an angle that i'm working versus at a competition i can see through that wall so it, yeah. there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. So I can visually, conceptually understand the difference. Mm -hmm. So I can play that game a little bit, but I can also, so it's, it's, it's playing, it's taking my knowledge and, and, and using it to play their game mm -hmm. essentially. So, uh, but I've already noticed just pushing to be more competitive in training has already helped me a little bit more in the, in the, in my job in the sense of being faster uh, because I'm trying to be faster in competition. Right. So I'm coming, I can be out of the holster mm -hmm. faster. I can put fast, my you know, splits are fat faster. Yeah. So I'm becoming a more efficient shooter in, in general uh, with that. So that's just something that I've kind of noticed uh, in, in my short time training because I wasn't going to sh start shooting competition. So I start, but when you kind of approach me and say, Hey, I really want to shoot competitions. I was like, well, you know, I probably need to, really start shooting competition to understand what I need to train her to do. So I was like, it's not going to hurt me to do this. So well, I jumped in on it. So. One, just to make a statement, it's admirable that you do what you do and you're trying to hone in on this one skill, especially given where kind of the world has been going. I would only hope that someone like you would be on call that day if something were to, to go down. Someone that really knew what to do in a high pressure situation. Next is going to those competitions, because I I went to your competition, I watched you shoot, um, so I know what, I, what I'm looking forward to. It was eye-opening. <laughs> the competitions are a lot more challenging than what you would think they would be, and there is a lot of competitive, serious shooters and moving targets, you have to move, you have to be running on just like unstable ground um, with the rocks and the, it's just, it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. The competitions are, they're not what you think they would be. And also with the competitions being in different locations, you don't really know what to expect each location. Like one of your competitions was outside with unsure footing is what I am gonna right. describe it as. And then your next competition was inside. And you're, you're in this small space where you're trying to, to navigate different targets. And so all of that will pour into what you do now, you right. know, especially, you know, with shooting, which is a little intimidating for me <laughs> because I know what is ahead for me and <laughs> that seems out of reach. Have you ever been to any of the competitions? What I'm going to say, it's shooting multiples. So when he has me shoot five rounds in a row or six rounds in a row, like, because mm. when you think you're in a high pressure situation, say I was, say I was in a threatening situation 
fighting for my life and I have my kids with me, I'm not just going to shoot one round, right? I'm going to shoot five or six rounds or who, who knows, whatever I have to do to just eliminate the threat to protect me and my children. Mm-hmm. I really struggle with the consecutive rounds. The, the firearm just seems to slip. It doesn't slip, literally mm-hmm. speaking, but my... My shots are a lot less accurate. I think you could agree to yeah, that. Yeah, so one of her issues is uh, uh, grip strength. So she's working on grip strength. Throttle control, uh, which is uh, uh, speed. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, throttle control. That's a uh, rate of fire. And I'm inconsistent right. with my rate of fire. Yeah, so her, ra- her rate of fire, yeah. but controlling controlling that rate of fire in an accurate manner. Uh, so, you know, so when I say throttle control, it's, it's not just the rate of fire, it's delivering accurate shots in a, in a, um, in a, in a good cadence. I don't, I don't, I don't like using the word cadence, but in a, in a desired speed. So whether yeah. that, that split would be a, you know, 0. 0.20 or 0. 0.25, you know, but in whatever desired speed that we're wanting her to shoot, you know, so. So, so sometimes she's doing it really well. Sometimes she's doing it, you know, a little bit slower. And it's getting better, but a lot of that has to contest to her um, uh, just grip strength. And then um, when she's, she overthinks shooting fast, so when she does that, she subconsciously over-tightens her strong hand, which gives her trigger freeze because she's trying to shoot fast. So she tightens up her strong hand, her, her gun hand, and that will lock up her trigger finger. So. And also, I'm not, if I was under a threatening situation and my target was close where I could use like a gross sight picture, in my brain I'm thinking, oh, this shot has to be perfect. Yeah. Instead of thinking like eliminate the threat, I'm thinking yeah. let's make perfect shots and that that also really slows me down. So we're yeah. working on that as well. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. wants, she's, instead of, you know, working on a, you know, uh, depending on, you know, so working on something with Fitz Law, you know, looking at, you know, a relative site, uh, a relative target based on um, distance and size of target uh, on whether you're doing a controlled slap or a violent slap with a, you know, trigger prep, uh, a trigger prep violent slap or a controlled slap with a gross sight picture, um, uh, you know, violent streak, controlled streak or a static, a static dot if you're using dots or iron sights depending on, you know, the sights that she uses is using a dot she's still learning what she needs to do uh, at those different distances and trying to figure figure that out so she's really wanting to let that dot settle a lot where when she doesn't need to let the dot settle so you know I have to sometimes get a little persuasive with her uh, uh, <laughs> with with wordage saying you know hey slap the trigger you know but it slap. works because in because it makes me feel less stressed so when he's yeah. like you know right now we're just gonna shoot faster so in that moment, I'm not worried about shooting accurate. I'm just worried about shooting faster. He puts low pressure on accuracy just in that moment in time, mm-hmm. just to get me, just to give me the feel of what it's like to shoot faster. And then we kind of correlate the two. Yeah, yeah, we intersect the two. So it and what, works. And, and what she really yeah. ends up finding, what we end up finding out is she doesn't really degrade in accuracy any. She just she ends up just shooting faster because she remain her her accuracy remains. I mean, she's still shooting alphas. You know, she may throw a Charlie out occasionally, but she's still shooting alpha. But when she throws a Charlie out, it's like she's like the straight A student that gets the B. She's like, oh, it's a Charlie. I'm like, okay, it'll be okay. It's gonna be fine. It's the first one of the day. We've been in it for an hour. You'll be fine. It's he does he does know when to put on the pressure and when when to take off the pressure and that helps my performance for sure. I mean, one time we were shooting, um, someone came and, and he was shooting with us and it was really funny because he was like, you know, you you've really slowed down, Ashley, and I was like, oh, like I was a little offended, you know. And the very next shot, I ended up making my fastest on target shot from holster target at one second. Yeah. And it was right after your comment. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking it was, like, it was, it was, it was point nine point nine seven from is actually you were using my you're testing out the new new holster with the Enigma. Yeah, the Enigma yes. holster with, and you're because you're looking at what kind of because she typically shoots a Glock forty five as her normal. Mm-hmm. What's what she's training with to shoot competition and stuff with, and. Um, 
and it's just too big for her to carry concealed. So I was like, well, this is what my wife carries concealed. It's a, it's a, uh, SIG P365 XL, uh, and uh, with the Enigma holster, I was like, I'll bring it in, let, let you test it out. So she, she strapped that on and, and ended up loving it. But, you know, she ended up going, you know, after I called her out, she ended up putting a, a shot on target and point, point nine, point nine seven uh, at seven yards in alpha. And the guy, the guy was like, it's pretty good. <laughs> But Clint, he knew what he was doing when he said it. And I was like, okay. Like, he called me out. Maybe I needed the reminder that, like, you know, be a little more confident in myself. Or just less pressure. Just relax. That's and, funny. and so it's been, it's been great. I mean, deciding to shoot with uh, American Patriot Defense, which is Clint's company, has been the best decision I've made in a long time. And it's, not only has it been educational, but it has been such a stress relief. So... <laughs> Yeah, and I think that this is a lot of the, well, this could never happen to me type situation, or this will never happen to me type situation. And also, you got to think, how often are you really with someone that's going to protect you? I mean, me, when I think about it, I'm alone with my kids the majority, the vast majority of the time. And I can't just depend on hoping that someone like Clint is existing in the room where some where something goes down right you know and that's what i think a lot of women are still riding on the backs of hoping that men will step up and i, I can tell you for that class i've had several people contact me over it and you know ask me about it and several people have mentioned that they're interested in it but they've got already had something going on that weekend are we going to have it again or it's you know, too can, cold the cold season's really hard people complain about the cold it's a lot. april it's gonna be in april it's now in, but yeah. people complain about the cold all the yeah. time but I mean, you know? so you know, they've they've asked if we're going to reschedule it or can we do it again at another later uh, later date. And here's the deal: I don't care to 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 reschedule a women's only class. It, do, it doesn't bother me to do that. Uh, it's just one of those deals. Is I, I, I've done this. I've I've offered a women's only class before, and it turned out pretty similar to this one too. Sometimes mm-hmm. they're they knock out. They knock out the part. They do really well. And sometimes, you know, a lot of times. Uh, what I find is some people are embarrassed to go to classes as well. They're afraid to go get training because they're like, well, I don't know anything about firearm. I'm afraid to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to be embarrassed because I don't know anything about it. Well, this class, actually, it's a novice level class. When I say a novice level class, my novice level class is here is your gun. Mm -hmm. Here's the bad end. Okay, here's mm-hmm. how you grip your gun. Here's how you load your gun. Here's how you put ammunition in your gun. Here are the four main safety rules. You know, we, we break it down. Here's how you take apart your gun. Yeah. You know, we really break it down. And, you know, you know, by the end of the day, you're getting some holster draws. But, mm-hmm. you know, we're not even getting to the holster draw. I, would, really. I feel like you're describing our first lesson, yeah. our first private lesson. Yeah, it's a really, yeah. it's a really, really basic rudimentary class just mm-hmm. to get people kind of used to it. You know, I, it's a really good class actually, either a prior to or a directly after, like if you were to take a Kentucky concealed carry class. Like mm-hmm. if you're, you know, like, you know what, I want to take a Kentucky concealed carry class, but I, I've never really touched my gun, so take it before, or like, hey, I've just taken the Kentucky concealed carry class that wasn't enough for me okay this is this is a little bit more in depth uh you know class after that so it's kind of like that but it's not getting into the actual meat and potatoes of actual self-defense shooting right so it's not it's not an intimidating class like it's 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 kind of like you know the first few lessons that you had with me Mm -hmm. uh i was really really nice yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I like. I like where our lessons have gone because you're not afraid to call me out. But also, if you call me out, I'm much more comfortable around you because I've right. I've had a lot of time around around Clint now to where I know, I feel like I know your personality. Right. And so he knows my personality as well, and he'll just you know. How to how to get her to be a repeat customer first before I could be mean to her? <laughs> he's never mean. He's never been mean. Yeah. But he's always been funny. I will say that he's always had a really, really good sense of humor. So when I have maybe like messed up is what I call it in his eyes, it wasn't a mess up. It's just stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. 
he's always been able to laugh with me. So he was never like too good to laugh with me about the beginner mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so that really helped me like warm up into the classes. You know, he's always encouraged me as well to like, he's always showed me new products. He has always taught me things. He's always made me comfortable with my firearm. And Mm -hmm. so I never felt like, I never felt inadequate to do a lesson or a class. Like I always felt like I was enough. You know, this, so. you know, this podcast is mostly supposed to be about you and not about my business. You realize that. But we, but we, <laughs> but that's just that's what we're funny. doing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I saw him out and I ended up asking him a random question, not even knowing that he taught firearms and, you know, he seems patriotic when you see him out. So I was like, that's a patriotic man. It's the beard. I'm going to ask this patriot if he knows anyone who teaches classes. (laughs) He was like, well, actually, I do. And I was like, well, then you're the one for me. No, (laughs) But anyway, so we started shooting together. And yeah, it just went from there. And it was really great. It was honestly a godsend. Because I was looking for someone to help teach me for two years. And I just couldn't find anybody. To do more of like those TikToks where he reaches out to the public and he kind of like gives like his feedback or like mm-hmm. experience like in like uh, uh gosh his professional opinions mm-hmm. on what he could do to like turn a terrible situation into yeah. something to where people come out of it okay like on the other end mm-hmm. that would be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be so good at it. Yeah. You don't. E- I just don't even think that he sees his own potential. Sometimes, like I, yeah. he's confident in teaching people how to shoot, but he has so much more beyond that. Yeah, he's got and a lot of knowledge. Yes, and I think that that would be a great one. I, yeah. I'm gonna go and teach my kids that. My dad, when I was growing up, had a mm-hmm. had a, a password. So if anyone were to pick us up and we never knew them, they were to know a password. And our password, and I'm an adult now was rumpled stiltskin mm-hmm. and that's not my kid's password that's but a hard, it's a hard word to say for a rumpled kid rumpled stiltskin so if a stranger were to come to school and pick us up and we didn't know who they were we were supposed to ask them the passcode and if they didn't know the passcode we are not to go with them same with knocking on the door and opening up the door if they didn't know our passcode and it didn't matter who they were they're not to even discuss anything with us exactly. unless they knew the passcode and, and that's after meeting your dad them. i can see him totally can't you <laughs> And he did this, unless they know the passcode. <laughs> My dad, uh, he's special, man. He's special. <laughs> and uh, he has taught me a lot. And I never knew my grandpa, my dad's dad. And my dad talks about him often, and he misses him dearly. But I would imagine that the reason my dad is the way he is is because of my grandpa, mm. who was supposedly an exceptional, successful, grounded human being and i know i'll meet him one day you know in the afterlife but i know that that's the reason my dad is the way he is yeah. outstanding so that was such a great word you never said the word outstanding i, was, I say me. outstanding all the time you know what next time i do something really great if you don't tell me outstanding i'm going to piss you better you better i've never you heard gotta, you say outstanding you, even you, when i shot a 0.97 which i thought was a one second so really it was 0.03 quicker you never said outstanding, and that was outstanding. It's acceptable. You, <laughs> you held back. I can't believe it. <laughs> now that I have shot with him, and I even went to South Carolina, and I went to shoot, and after shooting with Clint, I feel like nothing else is going to compare. Like, I'm just done at that point. Well, I mean. Well, mm, it's true. And so I Don't don't limit yourself to just me. Though. I'm not. And he's told me that from day 1. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of really really great great schools out there that and offer right way here. way will, more than I. And than I, I can will offer. go with you maybe to something <laughs> local in Nashville, but, but <laughs> I so I struggle I struggle with okay, once I have a good thing, like just just don't screw it up. If he's going to go and travel to all these schools and he's going to go and learn, he can just bring the information back to me. It's fine. I'm not looking to be a deputy, right? I'm just looking just looking to shoot some competitions, looking to protect my family. It's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Right here. It's great. Mm. I'll go to some of the classes. I'll learn. I'll be the best I can be. But I'm not letting anyone unteach me 
what I already know to be successful. Well, it's not. It's not unteaching. It's just. Mm-hmm. It's, well, that's it how you depends. Deve- it depends. It no. depends on who you're shooting with. That's that's how you develop yourself as a shooter, though, because how I teach something, somebody can give you the same knowledge or describe it a different way, and you pick it up a different way, and it, it, you're able to better yourself of it. So, like, how I, how I shot three years ago is not how I shoot now because I've been to different places, and I've, deve- I've constantly developed myself. And I will follow myself. And you to wherever those who you trust are. But beyond that, I'm not just going to go seek people out. I'm not just going to trust anybody. I'm not. I trusted you. I went on a limb. It turned out great. I flipped the coin. Got ahead. <laughs> like, landed perfect. Ace. There's, there's if he's going to go to a class. Tons of different. There's point one tactics, gun sight. Yeah. Modern Samurai Project. Perfect. War if Poet. You, perfect. I mean, if you recommend them. Chef's kiss. If not, no. I'm not just going to hand people my money. When I asked him, oh, do you know anyone who shoots? Like, that was like the four-leaf clover, baby. It reminds yeah. me of Independence Day. I'm pilot. I'm fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's I like how guns, I feel. I shoot. <laughs> that's how I feel. Like, I'm not... So many people, like, just are like, oh, yeah, I shoot. I'll teach you. But do you, though? No, yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, Come there's... on. Like, I get it. You have so much respect for other shooters, and I love that about you, and you're so humble in that area of your life. But for someone who doesn't know anything, going out in the world and just shooting with other people could actually be detrimental to their progress. Yeah, well, yeah. well there's something that I always do. I always say vet the instructor vet the school vet the instructor yeah, just don't go do. out don't go out the joe but like don't go out the, don't go out the joe bud's cabin and say oh this guy knows how to he said he knows how to shoot no no okay what's his credentials mm-hmm. okay. yeah no what you've it, always said that yeah, you've always said your vet instructor. your instructor yeah he has vet your instructor vet your instructor vet your schoolhouse yeah you're my vet so if you say this is good then this is good <laughs> like even my firearms like i don't even know what i own at this point I don't even know what I bought today. I bought a firearm today. I don't even know. He just told me to buy it. Oh, my God. He's like, here, buy it. <laughs> this is the one. Then this is the one. It's the one. It's a P360. <laughs> it's the one she shot and she liked. I did like it. He, he, we did. We, we went out. We tested it. <laughs> we tested different firearms. And I said, I like this firearm. So we found a, a great deal and sent me the firearm. And I bought the firearm eventually. I bought it. Eventually. But, yeah, eventually I had to fill it in there. But I wouldn't have bought the firearm if he didn't tell me to buy it because I trust him, and that's where trust comes yeah. in. You know, that's established trust. So, yeah, I wouldn't have just trusted Mark that I met at Kroger <laughs> with a Enigma host, holster. I would have been like, oh, "You're freaking Mark at Kroger in the food <laughs> section. Like, I'm not gonna trust you with my holster." Every Mark that works by at the, Kroger right now. Is... By, by, by the way, I where's the romaine out? at? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you get what I'm saying. You know, it was my four-leaf clover. Like, I just, it was a happenstance, and it turned out to be good. It turned out to be good. <laughs> but now that I know that it turned out to be good, I can look back and go, that was risky. That <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, was risky. Oh, so. Lord. That's hilarious. Well, but it's true. Don't yeah. limit yourself. And now I, like, pry him about his life, like, all his coins you know, all these, well, these... Yeah, we did a tabletop tour on the first episode. They all have yeah, and like this rug. This, this... Oh, it's it on... The couch is on it. This rug. I'm pretty sure it's from Afghanistan, baby. Yeah. It's 2013. Yes. You're in Afghanistan. Yeah. Right? I think you went in, what, 2011? 2012, 13. Okay, I was really close. See, I'm learning. <laughs> it has... We got ARs on here. We've got tanks. We've got choppas. We've got the map. We've got all sorts... See? Yeah. I'm learning all this stuff about you. Yep. Credentials, baby. Credentials. <laughs> Rogue has nothing to do with credentials. This is credentials. <laughs> I see this. I bought, like, that a, I bought that at a bazaar and haggled the guy down to like five bucks. Were you in Afghanistan? Yeah. Credentials, baby. <laughs> Hardly credentials, but okay. There's a grenade. Yeah. Multicolored grenade. <laughs> Multicolored grenade. <laughs> yep. I don't, I don't even remember. I think I paid more than five bucks for it. I think I paid you more than that. It wouldn't even matter. This is priceless. You're right. This is the is. kind of this is an heirloom. It, H- is, pri- it is priceless. Yeah. I give you that. Yes, what this is I, priceless. Personally, what I think. Five bucks or seven bucks. This is credentials. Uh, I saw this. I was like, that's my instructor. Are baby. tanks on the table? 
Okay, yeah, I mean, you can own whatever you feel like you need is necessary. I mean, if you want an anti-tank rocket... Okay, do you want someone with anxiety to answer if that you, question? If you, if, you want, <laughs> if you want a tank, if you want to... If you want to I mean, I, I, I personally... You know, I feel like you as the responsible gun owner, you need to take be responsible and take ownership and get training on whatever device you feel like you need you need ownership but i th i feel like i have no right to tell you what you should or should not have so i've seen so many irresponsible gun owners that they have just like a bunch of little kids running around and they're just guns just loaded yeah. laying out everywhere um that i can say with anxiety that I feel like everyone should be requ required or at least desire to seek someone out who knows more than them mm. to take lessons. I think they should be desired what? to, but I mean, who, who am I to have somebody required to do it? The Second Amendment but doesn't have anything about requirement. You're, you're exactly right. But if we're thinking about like protecting ourselves to the max, if we're thinking right. about, okay, I'm going to prepare myself to protect myself for my family right. or even my community, you're going to think that that desire would be there. Right. So I would recommend. I agree. I agree. We, but yeah. we have to take, we have to take emotion away from what the law says, what the root of the law says. Well, cool. <laughs> I'm just saying you have to, you have to separate At those this two point, things. You, I and I've never been here before in my life that I would want me you gotta, behind the that's barrel the way I look at it. I have to, I block. have to. At this point, now, now, if you would have asked me that five months ago, I would not have answered that. Right. Because bad bitches run, baby. <laughs> bad bitches run. Oh, my God. No. Because I didn't have the confidence that I have now. You're, to me, I mean, I agree. You know? Your average gun owner... To, I, I mean, I, your average gun owner does does not have enough training to yeah. to to probably do what is necessary or to protect themselves. Yeah. But we've also been proven. We've also seen your average gun owner protect themselves with a firearm with very minimal training. But then you have can people you have people complain. Come people, you have people complain about firearms, right? People are complaining all over the world about firearms. Mm -hmm killing innocent lives right right but we don't have good people that are willing to protect those innocent lives do you know what i mean so i feel like if you're going to buy a firearm and your intent is to protect you your family those around you then you should do what it takes to get the training that you need to be able to do that you should and, but i don't think it should be a, it shouldn't be a law or shouldn't be a requirement Oh, yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I might. Because, You're right. Because, because we have the right to bear arms. Because we because do. because if we make that a law, make a requirement, what's, uh, oh, well, you have to have a law and requirement to say these certain things in public. Tell that to Chicago. Yeah, I mean, look, you do exactly. have you do have the right to bear arms. You do. But as someone, like, if me firmly believing in that, then I also firmly believe that I should know how to handle those firearms. And I get it. That's not everybody. We all think differently. We all right. don't have anxiety. No, I agree. I mean, I'm, you know? I'm not going to get mad. At, everybody's got a, a entire But it has opinion. been so enlightening getting the training that I have. Mm -hmm. Prior to this, I'd been like, oh, yeah, I just give a firearm to anybody. But now that I have training, I see mm, that's really important. Well, I mean, again, that's, I mean, I've said this before in the, on the podcast, I think, and, and just in general. Like, that's one reason I, I started my company is, I mean, I went to the range one day just to kind of do some of my own stuff. And, you know, within 30 minutes, I had four guns pointed at me. And they weren't, they were not malicious in any, any, any way. Yeah. They were just poorly handled. Same. You know, just yeah. po poorly handled. And, mm -hmm. you know, instead of me just keeping my mouth shut and going about my day and accepting that I decided to walk down the line and say hey what's going on guys just so you know your gun was pointed at me let me teach you these things let me have you heard of these rules before how about we keep the gun pointed this way and it wasn't trying to you know you know out of the three people I addressed probably two of them thought I was being an asshole and the other one was like oh that makes a lot of sense you know mm -hmm. but at the same time if we'll say one person there was the one that was responsible teaching somebody here and they're teaching them the wrong thing, mm -hmm. you're 
teaching them that that's acceptable. Yeah. When it shouldn't be. Yeah. So. When I was in South Carolina shooting recently, I had the barrel cross me <laughs> umpteen hundred times. Right. You know what I mean? But just because they just weren't, they didn't know any better. They didn't think any better. I remember when I brought a friend from out of the country to shoot with you, I remember you were right there next to him and he had no idea how to shoot and Clint was right there just like waiting and when he shot, he was really nervous. It's just not in his culture to shoot and Clint just like was right there ready to take the firearm from him. You yeah. know what I mean? But you don't have that every day with right. just everyday shooters is what I'm going to call them because I've shot a lot and never once has safety been so implemented as it is yeah. now. Yeah, I when get I was, picked on a lot. But. I remember when I was first teaching her to reloads, um, man, she would she would go through, man, she'd go through brain farts bad. Like mm -hmm. just complete absences of, of, of what, and all shooting, like listen, all shooting is, you know, the, I don't care who you talk to. There's no, there's no tactical shooting or no advanced shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, shooting is shooting. Uh, uh, advanced shooting is just doing basic stuff uh, to a a perfect level or doing it at a, a a a superior level where you're taking imperfections out uh, and you're processing information information faster. That's all advanced shooting is. You won't convince me otherwise. So, you know, advanced shooting is just instead of you shooting one second or half second splits, you're shooting quarter second splits or 0.5 second splits. Okay, now you're shooting advanced. Mm -hmm. You know, or, you know, tactical shooting is not much different. Tactical shooting is, okay, now I'm going to add some footwork to it. You're still pulling the trigger. There's not much difference to it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's still shooting. Um, but regardless, uh, Shooting is just processing information. And when she was kind of early on processing information, teaching a reload, well, if you're a new shooter and you're not used to processing information, well, one, gripping the gun and shooting the gun is one thing. Well, dropping a magazine and inserting a magazine on a slide lock is is something completely new to her. So now we're just, I just remember her doing that and, mm -hmm. and like, She'd get a slide lock and she would just be having the gun in her hand, just like <laughs> flapping her hands. Like, and I'd be like, Yeah, yeah, you got to do something now. You're supposed to do something now. <laughs> but tap rack, tap rack. <laughs> I'd be like, Tap rack, tap rack, tap rack. <laughs> but, anyways, uh, this is going to wrap up uh, part one of this episode, and uh, we'll be back right, uh, right back at you with part two coming up.